Hello and welcome to my YouTube series, Witchy Ways. Today I'd like to talk to you a bit about the goddess and the god of modern witchcraft. Now, as I stated in previous uh, videos, I think in my introductory video, um, my blend of witchcraft is a mix of both Wicca and witchcraft. And so I tend to have a religious aspect to my witchcraft practice, whereas others might see witchcraft solely as a craft, as a practice of magic. But for myself, I am quite a spiritual person and the goddess and the god are very important to my witchcraft practice and so I'd like to share with you today a bit about uh, how I perceive deity in the tradition. So I see deity as dualistic in the witchcraft tradition. I see a goddess and a god. Deity, the all, the life force, is split into a divine feminine and a divine masculine. So I'll talk a bit about the divine feminine first, so the goddess. She has many different names, many different monikers. Uh, people probably know of Mother Earth, of Mother Nature, of Gaia. But the goddess is more than that. Um, the mothering aspect is quite important for the goddess in witchcraft and indeed in cultures and traditions all over the world. Uh, that divine feminine is often characterized by motherhood. And for a while, for myself, I found this very difficult because I'm childless by choice and I never really wanted children, so I had difficulty connecting with the mother aspect of the goddess in this tradition and in many other traditions. But then I realized that the goddess is so much more than that. And um, mothering could be replaced with the word nourishing. And so the mother goddess, the mother nature, mother earth, is simply the aspect of nourishing within nature and nurturing within nature. Um, she is the divine feminine energy. She's often portrayed as the goddess of the earth, but she's also portrayed as the goddess of the moon. Whereas the god in witchcraft and in Wicca is often seen as a solar deity, the goddess is personified or has chosen her symbol to be the moon. And so this again ties in with the divine feminine in the fact that the moon goes through a monthly cycle, which is very similar to the cycle that uh, women have during their lives, um, especially during the years of their own fertility. So. The 28-day cycle of the moon is reflected within women in their menstrual cycle. And so with the cycle of the moon, we see the different phases of the moon, which can be reflected in the phases of a woman's life. We have the dark of the moon, and this can be seen as the time when women are bleeding in their menstruation. Then we have the waxing moon. This can be seen as the time of building up of the uterine lining. Then we have um, the full moon, and this can be seen as ovulation. Then we have the waning moon, and this can be seen as the breaking down of the uterine lining, and then back full circle to the dark moon again when we have the bleeding time. As well, the phases of the moon can be representative of the stages of a woman's life, where the goddess is often seen in a triple aspect, especially in relation to the moon, and they call this the maiden, mother, and crone. So the maiden is the young aspect, the mother is the middle years, and the crone is the elder years. Some people, uh, myself included, have had problems with uh, maiden, mother, and crone because um, after motherhood, most of us aren't ready to be called a crone, you know. If When we finish our fertile years in our 40s or 50s, um, we're not quite yet ready 
to be called a crone. And so I've seen a, a, a surge of bringing in a fourth aspect. And this actually reflects the four aspects of the moon because the moon has a dark, waxing, full and waning aspect. So those are four aspects in the moon cycle. So we can have four aspects in a woman's life. And that might, that might be reflected in maiden, mother, queen and crone. So the queen years can be seen as the time in a woman's life when she has fully come into her own power. Perhaps if she has decided to have children, those children have left the nest and now she is rediscovering her own power, rediscovering who she is and doing what she wants for herself in life. There are many different pantheons that are quite popular in uh, Wicca and in witchcraft for different goddesses. Probably the most popular would be Celtic or Greek and sometimes Roman pantheons. Um, popular goddesses would be Aradia, who is known as the one who brought witchcraft to the people, who taught witchcraft to the people. We also have uh, Diana from the Roman pantheon. We have Artemis from the Greek pantheon. There's Morgan and Brigid from the Celtic pantheon. There's Freya from the Norse pa uh, pantheon. Um, also Caridwen from the Welsh tradition. These are all some of the most popular goddesses to be found within modern witchcraft. Hello, Kiwi. You're so pretty. Yeah, isn't she pretty? Here's my beautiful girl. Say hello to everybody. Oh, you're gonna say hi? Hi? You gonna say hi? Yeah? Oh, it's Nuggle Boys. You Nuggle Boys. You Nuggle Boys. Within witchcraft, we also honor the divine masculine. So, this would be the god of witchcraft. And he's probably most often known as the Lord of the Hunt or the Lord of Animals and as the Green Man or a vegetation deity. Um, whereas the goddess is the earth itself, the god can be seen as the green and growing things upon the earth. He is the actual cycle of growth and decay that we see in nature that happens in the context of the goddess. Um, he is the manifestation of growth and of growing things. The god is also often known as the god of forests, uh, the god of mountains, whereas sometimes the goddess is seen as the goddess of earth he is sometimes known as the god of the sky, so we have the interplay of earth and sky. Um, he is definitely a solar deity, so as I said before, um, got cat hair <laughs> everywhere. Whereas I said before, the, the goddess is um, symbolized by the moon, the god is symbolized by the sun, and we have the interplay and the dance between sun and moon, between the sun and the earth and the seasons. There's often, just as there is with the goddess, uh, there's often three aspects of the god, um, and these are sun, lover, and sacrifice. But again, uh, we can introduce a fourth aspect to the god if we're working with four different aspects of the goddess. So he can be sun, lover, king and then sacrifice to complement the queen aspect um, of the goddess. The most popular gods uh, probably found within witchcraft um, are Kernunos, which is um, an antlered god, and Hearn the Hunter um, of the English um, folklore, again an antlered god. Within Wicca and witchcraft, um, you'll often hear people talking about a horned god. Uh, and this can be um, Pan from um, Greek mythology. But people often confuse um, the term horns with the term antlers, which is um, one of my little pet peeves and little bugbears. 
um, people calling Kernunos a horned god when actually they're not horns, they're antlers. Um, <laughs> very different, um, very different things. Antlers are branched and horns are one single. But that's just me probably being facetious. Um, there is a beautiful myth within uh, Wicca and modern witchcraft of the dance of the goddess and god which is seen reflected throughout the seasons. And so it's the, the solar god and how he is working with the goddess of the earth throughout the year and throughout the wheel of the year. In my previous video I very, very quickly introduced the eight sabbats which are the solar aspects uh, and solar festivals um, celebrated within modern Wicca and witchcraft. And so I'll, I'll just talk a little bit more about the mythology behind those eight Sabbaths. So we begin, we can begin at Yule, and this is seen where the goddess gives birth to the god. So Yule takes place at the winter solstice around the 21st of December, and this is the day when um, after three days, we can start to see the sun growing in strength and the days becoming ever so slightly longer and they become longer and longer and longer up until we get to the summer solstice. So at the winter solstice, the goddess gives birth to the god. Then the next festival that we have is Imolk and Imolk can be seen as the first steps of the young solar god being taken um, beside the mother goddess. So the sun's strength is returning, the earth energy is returning to the land, and side by side the mother and the sun are starting to walk the land, and we see the first signs of spring, at least here in the UK, with the snowdrops and um, other different forms of flora and fauna starting to change their habits. The next uh, festival and Sabbath that we have is um, the Spring Equinox, also known as Ostara. And this is when the god has reached kind of his teenage years, his young adulthood, where he's striving for individuation from the mother. So the god is young, he is wild, and um, he's trying to find his own feet in the world. Again, this is relating to the sun still growing in strength, but now we have reached the tipping point, the balance point, where day and night at the spring equinox are equal. And then all of a sudden it tips over and the days start to become longer than the nights. This flows into the next festival, which is Beltane. And at Beltane, the god has reached sexual maturity. So he's a young adult now. And it's said at Beltane, the goddess and the god fall in love. And then from their union, all of life springs forth into beautiful blossom. So we see the hawthorns coming out into full blossom. We see flowers really starting to come into their own. The trees have burst into leaves. Um, and it's, it's a celebration of the start of summer because for the ancient Celts of these lands, uh, Beltane signaled the start of the summer season as they only had two seasons. They had winter and summer. So it's the start of summer, it's fruition, it's fertility, it's the land coming into its own. And then after Beltane, we have the summer solstice and this is the time of highest light. So this is the time when the solar god has reached the peak of his strength and also of his maturity. Uh, and we can see this often reflected in um, myths, especially um, in these lands where the king is wedded to a form of the goddess. And so it's accepting that kingship and accepting the fact that the, he is making this pact with the land and in making this pact with the land, he realizes that he is going to have to die for the land at a later point in the year. And this is seen in the summer solstice when the sun has reached its zenith in the sky. It is the longest day, 
but after the summer solstice, each day will continually get shorter up until we reach the winter solstice. The following festival is the first harvest, uh, and this is Lamas, sometimes known under the Celtic name of Lunasa. And this takes place um, at the end of July, beginning of August. This is when the first fields of wheat are uh, being harvested here in the UK, and it is seen as the god, the vegetation god, who has brought all these beautiful crops from the green shoots up through until the ripening of the corn and the grain, ready to be harvested. So this is the first kind of slashing of the god's power and bringing it in to feed the people and to nourish the land. Then we have a second harvest which follows in um, September at the September fall equinox and this is called Mabon. And this is the second harvesting of the God's power. And this is a time when other crops are being brought in from the fields, there's tractors everywhere on the roads in rural locations such as where I am. And as well it's a time of apples and berries everywhere in the hedgerows. So it's a time of great fruition. It's a time of really reaping what you have sown earlier in the year. And in relation to the God, again, this is seen as the second harvesting of his power and also readying the God for his descent into the underworld when he dies, which happens at the next festival. The next festival is called Samhain, and that's a Celtic word meaning summer's end. And this takes place on the 31st of October, otherwise popularly known in secular culture as Halloween. And at Samhain, the god dies, enters the underworld, and is ready to be reborn of the goddess again at Yule. So that's just a, a brief overview of the myth, the mythology, and the interplay between the goddess and god throughout the Sabbaths. So this is um, a nice counterpart to the celebration of the Divine Feminine, which we see during the Esbats, which is when we honour the moon cycles. So there's 12 to 13 full moons every year, and there's eight Sabbaths in the wheel of the year. So we, we have a balance between male and female and cycles within cycles. So this is just a brief overview of the goddess and the god in modern witchcraft. And um, I hope to be filming my next video outside. Right now it's still far too windy outside to record anything. It's been windy for weeks now. We have had gale force winds and gusts and storm after storm battering our coasts and well, the entire island. So hopefully next week I'll be able to go outside and um, do some filming outside and talk to you outside. In the meantime, thank you so much for joining me and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of this series and uh, blessings. Thank you.